I'm glad you're here at the Gonzaga Socratic Club. Uh, if you've been here before, you've heard me offer a little spiel about what the Socratic Club is. But uh, just this week, as I was putting up posters, I had to explain to someone who saw the name club and they started looking in the list of clubs and student organizations at Gonzaga for the Socratic Club. It's not exactly a club in that sense. The name is, uh, is after and in honor of the, uh, of the Oxford Socratic Club, which was started in the 1940s at Oxford University. And its president was the famous author and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis. And like the Oxford Socratic Club, the Gonzaga, Gonzaga Socratic Club exists to critically reflect on and explore uh, Christianity and the Christian worldview. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's the name of the club and that's what we're all about. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Terry Schiavo, human dignity, and Catholic health care. One of the most significant legacies of the synthesis of pagan classical culture with Judaism and Christianity is the notion that human <coughs> beings have inherent value. While this idea took many centuries to gestate and develop, and while it was frequently honored more in principle than in practice, uh, this, inherent, this idea of inherent human value, the idea of human dignity, what we now call human dignity, is a central principle of Western theology, ethics, and politics. It's rooted in the notion of human distinctiveness, understood in two mutually intertwined ways. First, human beings are functionally distinct due to our capacity for reasoned reflection. We are among living things the animal that is rational, that is not only aware of the environment and the self, but is also able to reflect on the principles that govern nature and the self. Secondly and relatedly, we are, according to the Jewish Christian tradition, creatures made in the imago Dei, the image of God, who reflect in our rational and spiritual nature our unique divine origin. As our speaker will explain shortly, the idea of human dignity was nurtured and developed in Christian communities over centuries as people experiencing suffering reflected on how best to honor the imago Dei who lives among us in the form of the ill person. While the notion of human dignity came under significant and sustained philosophical, theological, and scientific challenge in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it nevertheless remains a key principle of law, international law, and biomedical ethics, uh, and even more so, uh, and incre with increasing importance, one might say. If anything, in the aftermath of World War II, it became indispensable as a way of articulating the boundaries of proper and legitimate treatment of individuals by political regimes. And then, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the principle of dignity emerged as a basic point of reference in method, medical ethics for practices of proper treatment of patients, especially in end-of-life contexts. So human dignity provides a principle for human action, and it is particularly important in medicine or healthcare. But how is this principle to be implemented? Our speaker today, Dr. Rosemary Valbrecht of the Gonzaga Philosophy Department, will explore for us how the principle of dignity has throughout its influence been a principle applied to concrete cases of human suffering, honored at the bedside of the person who is seriously ill. Dr. Volbrecht brings to this conversation a wealth of experience uh, reflecting on teaching and writing about medical ethics and principles of action in the healthcare context, having taught healthcare ethics in the philosophy department and the nursing department for years here at Gonzaga, and having published in 2001 the book Nursing Ethics, Communities and Dialogue. Uh, we're very privileged to have a response to Dr. Volbrecht's presentation offered by Sally Denton, who is the administrative director of St. Joseph's Care Center here in Spokane. And she's going to, uh, as, as someone involved in, in nursing and in care, uh, is going to give us some concrete applications of what Dr. Volbrecht has to say. I thought they would have a...
presentation response, but Rosemary told me it's going to be more like a tag team thing. Right. So, so we're in for a treat. Uh, let's welcome our speakers. Thank you. It's impressive to see anyone at 410 on a Friday afternoon, so thank you for, for coming. And I, I especially want to thank Sally for, for being here. Um, Sally and I have, have collaborated on, on various projects for a, uh, a number of years. And uh, in particular, um, Sally and I were, were part of a, a committee, an organization that uh, helped to develop and implement the POLST form, which is uh, Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, and implemented that in Washington State. And if you ever need a bulldog on your side, Sally's the person you want to call. Sally took on the uh, Department of Human and Health Services, uh, who was being very resistant uh, to this uh, change. And Sally's uh, traveled around the state uh, educating, especially people, uh, administrators and staff in uh, skilled nursing facilities about the use of this, this form. And she's continued uh, to work with the statewide committee that, that keeps that form uh, up to date. So, you know, David's eloquent uh, introduction uh, maybe reflects the fact that you've been on sabbatical and had time for sustained uh, thought, uh, but thank you for the context. Um, talking about uh, ethics in, in Catholic health care, uh, uh, I want to talk today about what I see and not just uh, me, uh, what I have to say today isn't really original, um, but some shifts taking place within uh, Catholic health care. I have um, served on uh, a couple of ethics committees here in Spokane with Holy Family Hospital, with Sacred Heart uh, Hospital, and, and with a, a committee that Sally and I were instrumental in, uh, the Community uh, Long-Term Care Ethics uh, Committee. And uh, in all of those contexts, I've been so impressed by the consistent affirmation of the value of life, and especially within Catholic health care, the commitment to serving all people regardless of their ability uh, to pay, which uh, becomes increasingly more difficult. Um, but I've also been very impressed with how the tradition of Catholic health care has always been deeply uh, rooted in bedside context. And more recent uh, developments, particularly in light of, of some uh, teachings that have come from the Vatican about uh, the use of artificial nutrition and hydration, particularly for, for persons in persistent vegetative state, really do reflect a kind of shift from that very contextual, holistic kind of thinking at the bedside to more deontological or absolutist kind of thinking, which is a more kind of top-down uh, kind of thinking. So um, I hope to be able to say enough to give you a sense of, of that contextuality of, of the tradition and kind of how that is being called into question in light of uh, some recent uh, developments. As, as David said, Catholic health care developed as a compassionate pastoral response to people who were ill, who were suffering. Initially, hospitals really provided very little medical care. Um, early hospitals were primarily a place for persons who could not afford to have private uh, nursing care in the home. Um, they were primarily places where uh, people of, of meager means were able to go while dying to be sheltered, to be fed, and to be provided with whatever kind of relief um, from their suffering uh, was, was possible. So that, that early commitment to everyone 
has dignity regardless of social status was essential um, from the very beginning in Catholic health care. Uh, as medicine developed some capacity to treat illness and injuries, patients and their families often faced very difficult ethical decisions. Um, I've always been intrigued reading about some of the choices uh, that people were making when the first surgical techniques uh, became available and were used. You may have seen some movies that are in the Civil War era, you know, that, that show some of this, this surgical technique. You know, anesthesia, you know, your, your pain med was, a, you know, a slug of whiskey and here's a bullet to bite on. That, at one time, you know, if you had gangrene and you were going to die if we didn't amputate your leg or your arm or something, you know, the choice you were offered was, well, you know, the chances that you'll die of infection after we do this are extremely high because they knew very little about antiseptic conditions. And we can't really do much of anything uh, for your pain. So we're going to lop off your limb. You're probably going to die. It's going to hurt an awful lot. Right, but this is what we have to offer. You know, in those kinds of situations, you know, people of faith turn to pastoral people, generally priests, you know, saying, you know, I want to be faithful, I want to be um, uh, a good Christian, I want to, you know, I want to respect the value of human life, but Father, do I really have to do this? You know, is, is this really an obligation right, in light of the, the picture that they're painting uh, for me. Um, you know, other kinds of questions arose when there were possible medical treatments available, but only if the patient could travel a very long distance, um, probably in a wagon, um, which in itself meant probably a lot of pain. Um, and the very real possibility that the patient uh, could die uh, away from home, away from family. Uh, and again, people were saying, okay, they're telling me there's, you know, there's some help. It's a long distance away. It's going to be really hard to get there. It's going to cost a lot for me to get there. And again, you know, am I really obligated uh, to pursue this? So it was those kinds of, of questions and a real struggle of conscience, right, and dialogue between individuals and their families uh, that were ill, that were suffering, possibly dying. Dialogue between them and, and priests and others who were providing spiritual care that really developed a very rich, uh, long tradition of moral decision-making within the context of Catholic health care. So again, I think the, the two real strengths of that tradition are one, it's continual affirmation of, of human dignity regardless of uh, one's social status or any other external uh, conditions. And secondly, the the contextuality, the holistic way in which these, these uh, moral decisions are being made by looking at the context of this person's uh, situation and you know, trying to make decisions in the light of that context. The shift in Catholic uh, tradition, I think, is evident, particularly in the response to the Terry Schiavo case, and in a very critical papal allocution that came out in 2004. The Terry Schiavo case began in 1998 and amazingly was not uh, resolved until 2005. So it was a very long uh, kind of a process. Um, the papal allocution in 2004, you know, really reflected the increasing concern within the church about what the church perceived as, you know, a lot of uh, threats to human indignity, um, a kind of utilitarian devaluation of, of human life. Uh, some of these threats 
There were legal initiatives to legalize physician-assisted suicide, both in California and in Washington State. In 1989 in California, in 1991 in Washington State, uh, physician-assisted suicide was uh, approved in the state of Oregon in 1994. Um, the well-publicized uh, actions of Dr. Kevorkian in Michigan uh, during this time, and the practice of euthanasia, direct um, physician killing of, of patients that uh, was taking place and continues to be legal in parts of Europe. So that, that's really kind of the context for this, this response. Um, and I think this, this shift reflects two major kinds of changes. One, a shift from that very contextual, proportionate reasoning to a more absolutist reasoning. And secondly, the shift from that very contextual kind of reasoning to a much more top-down kind of uh, decision-making. So the, the proportional reasoning, and, and I hope all of you got a handout, and, and uh, this is going to be key to our discussion, so I wanted you to be able to have it in front of you. As I said, this, this tradition really stretches back all the way to the 16th century. Um, in, its, in its current formulation, uh, Gerald Kelly published a very critical um, essay in 1951 that really kind of crystallized this, this current uh, formulation. So it says life is valuable, right? That's the starting point. And in light of that value, we, we do have an obligation to maintain um, and our health and to preserve our lives. But that this obligation is not unlimited, right? So life, human dignity, yes, it's value, valuable, but, but our obligation to preserve that is not an unlimited obligation. So we need to have some process to help us discern what are the limits. And the tradition that's developed uh, uses the language of proportionate and disproportionate care. Originally, the language was ordinary, extraordinary care, and that language kind of became corrupted because people started attaching ordinary to certain specific uh, medical treatments and extraordinary to certain treatments. And the language of proportionate and disproportionate, you know, by its very nature, reminds us that we're always looking at a kind of relative assessment, right? So we're not obligated to preserve our lives when the burdens of treatments become disproportionate to the anticipated benefits, right? So it's always the burdens relative uh, to the benefits. So disproportionate care includes the burdens of treatment in terms of pain, in terms of effort, inconvenience, um, financial costs, primarily from the patient's perspective but not exclusively from the patient's perspective. The family, the community's perspective is also relevant. Um, and when these things are disproportionate relative to these anticipated uh, benefits of the treatment. So it's important to note that what's being assessed when we're assessing is this disproportionate care. We are not assessing, is this a human being? Is this human being worth saving? Is this a life worth living? And it's not an assessment of the quality or value of this individual human life. It's an assessment of the treatment. It's an assessment of the burdens that this treatment imposes um, and looking then at those burdens relative to the expected benefits. Um, it's always been clear in the Catholic tradition that this proportionate, disproportionate care <coughs> distinction applies in all contexts of illness and not simply in the context of imminent death. So you can imagine, for instance, that a treatment might be available 
It has a high likelihood of curing an illness or at least extending the patient's life, perhaps for decades. But suppose that that treatment is extremely painful and extremely unpleasant. Right? It's going to have all kinds of uh, side effects right, that are going to be uh, very repugnant. Um, and it would require to have this retreat this treatment requires complete isolation from your family for a matter of months. And this is an experimental treatment. It's not covered by health insurance, Medicare, or Medicaid. So you and your family have to bear the complete costs. And that doing so would completely wipe out your family's uh, savings resources and leave your entire family homeless. Here's a situation where we're not talking about someone who who's, has imminent threat of death, right? There is something we could do um, that could make a significant difference. This person will continue to live for a while. But it's still relevant and appropriate to ask, right, what are the burdens? What's it going to cost, cost in a very broad sense, right, to be able to pursue this? And, and is that? Uh, too much. Right? It, does that take me beyond that point of my responsible valuing of, of my life? Does it take me beyond the point of moral obligation? So let me present a case. This is a very typical uh, kind of case in contemporary healthcare. Here's a 59 year old diabetic. Uh, Complications uh, from his diabetes include kidney failure and blindness. And Mr. Klein's been on dialysis now for two and a half years. It requires him to go three times a week and eight hours of dialysis each time. The prognosis, as best right, his uh, physicians can say, is he'll likely die sometime within six months, but it's not imminent um, if he continues with, with dialysis. But in spite of the fact that the dialysis is keeping him alive, the dialysis works in the sense that it does take the toxins out of his, his bloodstream. Even when he has the dialysis, he rarely feels well physically. Right? Even after the eight hours of treatment, he feels better, but the effect doesn't last very long. Right? He immediately begins uh, to feel the buildup of these, these toxins. And he's increasingly frustrated by what does it require, right? going three times a week, spending eight hours at a time, um, doing this treatment, the sense of being tied to this, this dialysis, and you know that he just doesn't feel well. Right? He did, right, when he began dialysis two and a half years ago. Right? He'd have dialysis and he'd feel good, right? He could go out, work a job, pursue his hobbies, etc. But two and a half years later now, right, the returns are getting less and less. And at this point, Mr. Klein is saying to his family, I really want to stop this dialysis. So we can apply this criteria of proportionate, disproportionate care. Right? This is not an easy decision for Mr. Klein to make, certainly not an easy decision for his family. Um, to, to help him make and to accept what is his decision might be. But if we think about what are the burdens here, there are significant burdens. And what's the benefit? Well, yes, the dialysis works, right? It does remove the toxins and he will continue to live. Right? But his, his experience daily of living now is that the dialysis is less and less effective, right? Leaves him 
not feeling really well at any point right, in time. And this case is like many other cases that I would say is kind of in the middle. Right? We can think of these decisions as on a continuum. There are going to be some of these kind of cases where it's really obvious that the burdens right, are not disproportionate to the benefit. There are going to be cases at the other end where it will be very clear right, that there's so little or no benefit that the, that the burdens are excessive and disproportionate. This is probably somewhere in the middle. Right? We could imagine other diabetics in this context who might decide to continue for a few more months, right? perhaps even you know, to the point of death. But I think it's very reasonable for this patient in this context with his assessment to say, I think I've reached the limit of my obligation. I, I see the burdens now as disproportionate to the benefits. And I'm choosing to stop the dialysis. And doing that, you know, he will die fairly quickly. A matter of days? Three. Three? Three, Three to days? Five. Three to five days? Okay. Okay. So that's supposed to be a pretty clear case. So hopefully it is. <laughs> Much harder cases have to do with the use of artificial nutrition and hydration. And there's been a lot of discussion, both in Catholic and non Catholic healthcare, about. Uh, artificial nutrition and hydration. Um, and questions about is this analogous in a moral sense to things like stopping dialysis or deciding not to do CPR in certain cases or a decision not to pursue a third round of chemotherapy or a decision you know, to remove a patient from a respirator. Right? All of which are very commonly uh, done. Right? And lots of other examples of life-sustaining treatments. Right? And yet, you know, artificial nutrition and hydration for some people is what keeps them alive. And yet, many people struggle with making a decision to stop this medical treatment. And I think it's, it's helpful to look at, I mean, what are, what are the hopeful benefits of, of artificial feeding and, and hydration? I mean, one of the big ones is to prevent aspiration pneumonia. Uh, someone who has difficulty with swallowing is very susceptible to basically inhaling food that, that is going to go down into the lungs and, and cause pneumonia. Preventing bed sores and other consequences of malnutrition. Um, generally improving quality of life, improve functional status, increase strength because you've got a person who's just not able uh, to sustain an appropriate level of nutrition. To prolong this person's survival, to prevent suffering. So the, you know, the primary reasons for using artificial nutrition and hydration would be there's a problem with swallowing. This person either cannot swallow or has extreme difficulty swallowing or it's just unsafe for this person to swallow. Or simply a failure ability to maintain an adequate level of, of nutrition and, and hydration. There are various types, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but basically going through the intestinal tract or an intravenous route. What I want you to notice just in looking at this slide is there's a lot of technical stuff here, which should remind us we're talking about something that is a medical treatment. This involves, in many cases, surgical procedures to insert peg tubes, for instance. It requires nursing care to monitor 
um, and to continue these, these forms of artificial uh, feeding. So as we look at this and, and ask ourselves again, right? Do the same ethical principles apply? <coughs> Principle of beneficence, to promote the patient good, the value, promoting the value of human life. But with the proviso that we have an obligation to do so up to the point where it's disproportionate costs. And I think, you know, many people recognize at least there's a theoretical analogy here. Right? It does seem like, yes, this is a medical treatment. Yes, the same kind of questions are coming up here. And yet, there's a lot of resistance to thinking of removing artificial nutrition and hydration in the same way we might think about stopping dialysis. And I think, if you think about it, obviously there are a, a number of emotional aspects that are tied to eating, that really make artificial nutrition and hydration, if not morally different, it certainly has um, a difference for us in terms of our kind of emotional attachment. Uh, oops. It's one of the primary ways that we show that we care for someone. How many of you at home during spring break how many of you asked mom or dad if, if dad's the cook, will you make those special cookies that you make? Or, yeah? Or some other, you know, there's some favorite dish. I mean, I mean, when you're eating a cod, probably almost anything mom and dad would, <laughs> would be an improvement, right? But it, it's primary, right? It's a primary way that we say to people, welcome. You know, welcome into my home, let me care for you. It's, it's so primary in our socialization. And right? it's part of the pattern of interacting, being family, you know, going through our day. For many people uh, who are in skilled nursing facilities, it adds an important routine to the day. My father for the last year and a half has been in an assisted living facility and I've visited him a number of times and I can tell you meals are really important in, in these facilities. Right? It's something to do, it's an event, but it's also a very social event, right? Everyone's there. Um, and even just the pleasure of eating, right? We all have our guilty uh, pleasures right, in terms of, of food. Dan here prefers healthy things. He's been well <laughs> habituated to pre pre prefer apple juice over, uh, what was it? Root beer. Root beer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, patients and caregivers trying to make these kind of decisions, you know, there are a lot of concerns. You know, one of the primary ones is when we think about starving, I mean, how many B movies can you think of that you've seen, right? Someone's in the desert dying of thirst, right? Or somebody's, you know, starving to death. It's painful. Right? Uh, dehydration makes people sick. And the obvious that if this person doesn't eat, she is going to die sooner. Or the sense that, you know, I want to provide the best care for mom or dad or my child or whoever it is that I'm caring for. And just, you know, I'm not ready to let this person go. But we still have to come back to considering benefits and burdens um, of artificial nutrition and hydration and recognizing that there are a lot of different contexts in which uh, this might be used, and that the context uh, does matter. So let me go to the next. So Sally, I asked Sally if she would talk about um, her experience. Um, Sally's worked both as a nurse and as an administrator in skilled nursing facilities. And I asked her to talk about a case involving uh, 
a patient where death is imminent? You know, um, when Rose Marie first came and talked to me and said, will you do this? She said, do you have anybody that is in persistent vegetative sleep in their building that is always getting two feedings of IV hydration? And I said, no. And I've been there for a number of years, since 97. We used to all the time. And now, since 2000, physician's orders for life-sustaining treatment. And we try and have these conversations about what do you want to do if, before we get into that really highly emotional time. So picture yourself as the, the decision maker in um, the case of your own parents. And someday you'll be there. Somebody. And if it's you that has to make the decisions, um, you're going to have to weigh what the right thing is to do with the information you have at the time. And so when, when somebody comes to our nursing home, I call it a skilled nursing facility, I call it a rehab center, I call it a nursing home. You know, I just try not to miss words. It's 162 beds. And it isn't just where people go to die, because we rehab people and they transition to the home. But oftentimes it's where people go to die, because they won't let people stay in the hospital anymore. They, they greet people, they treat them, and then they street them, is what they say. They greet, treat, and street. And, and you're not considered being acute care, you know, if you're just dying. And if you're not going to go home, then you're going to come to us. And if you haven't had that education or that exposure to what it's like to make those decisions, then we have to do all of that with you at a time when um, you're really stressed out. And I can tell you that um, my uh, father died a couple of years ago in my building, and I had to have these conversations with my mother. He had a change of condition, and then hospital. They said, well, he's got three new beds and he has to leave. So I said, all right, let's bring him to St. Joseph's. He was dying. He was dying. There, we, had, we had discussed his condition with the doctor. Um, the doctor said there isn't any chance that he's going to recover from this. He was 94 years old. He had multi-system failure. And let's make him comfortable. So we brought him over to our building, and mom comes into my office, and she says, where's his IV? They've got to keep him hydrated, and he's not eating. And I said, you know, she's heard me talk about this for years, but it never registered with her that hydration makes a person that's in multi-system failure more you think about the kidneys, you think about the lungs, and you think about pumping fluid into somebody that can't do anything like that. You know, the kidneys aren't working, the fluid starts to collect in the lungs, the breath, you know, the, the whole process of breathing becomes more laborious. And that isn't a nice thing to do for people. And to try and educate people that we're making them more uncomfortable by keeping the IV going and keeping the fluids going into that person, that just isn't something that they want to hear. They, they want to hear, well, what are we going to do to help them? Because we don't want anybody to die. We don't want to die. Nobody ever wants to die. And we're in a society now where, where we're doing more um, left ventricular assist devices than we are transplants, and people live forever on machines. You know, because we don't ever want to let people die. And so when it comes to a point of, you mean you're not even going to keep them hydrated? People get sick if they get dehydrated. Well, actually, when, when the body doesn't get fluid anymore, it actually gets more comfortable. Because you're not taxing it and asking it to metabolize all this fluid. 
And so almost all of our nurses now are trained on uh, really good comfort care and how to have these conversations with families when everybody's in agreement that this is what the plan of care for that person is going to be. And that's the key part. You can't do this unless you have those conversations. Sometimes you have to have them up front long before a person is ever going to die. Just to say, so what if? What if, what if, what if? And hopefully you can participate in those decisions yourself. And you can have those conversations with those people who love you and will be making those decisions. And then when it comes time that somebody actually has to make the decisions, it's easier. And it's a little more humane. It is such an honor for me to do the work that I do and actually get paid for it. To be present in the room when somebody actually dies and, and witness that, that peaceful death that we help provide as a result of, of really good care. So um, when it comes to people that are, are imminently dying, um, that's what I would say about that. Okay. And, yeah, hang on, don't go away. <laughs> As I said before, you know, food and drink are such basic symbols of care and of human connection, of community. And the, to stop feeding people, uh, I think one of the big fears, like, like your mom was saying, is there's this sense that we're abandoning this person. And I think it's important you know, to remember, and part of when you say that your, your staff is trained in um, providing comfort care, you know, part of that is, is understanding that there are other ways, right? Other ways to continue to care for that person, to help that person be more comfortable. Right? And these are some of the the things uh, that can be done. But it's also recognizing there are other ways we can continue to show care, right? Not just relieve the dryness right, of dehydration with ice chips, but also, you know, to stay connected uh, to that person, to be with that person during uh, that dying process. So that withdrawing Artificial nutrition and hydration does not mean we have to abandon the patient, right? Or the, that we disconnect <laughs> from, from the patient. So, um, I'm wondering, Sally, if you can, I've got here about two people, but you pick whatever you want. Two feet. You know, um, we don't have very many people with two feet anymore as a result of the pulse and the work that we've done in there. Oftentimes people, if they, um, if they, let's say for example they had a stroke and they can't swallow very well, it could be that that stroke will reverse itself over time and they'll be able to swallow again. And so we might do a temporary tooth feeding and we have that conversation with family and, and the care is always centered around the individual. Do I want anybody making decisions for me? No, I want to make decisions for myself. And so we never have a, a care conference or that, that process where we make decisions without the individual being present in the room if possible or hearing their voice so they can say, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. In the event that there is no hope that anybody is ever going to get their swallow back. Are they going to have a permanent tube feeding? And they get to make that decision. I, I know of a couple of cases that I could tell you about in our building where people have made that decision and they have lived for years and they have had quality of life. We've got a, a 36 year old in our building that had a motor vehicle accident and had a head injury. And, you know, his family wanted really aggressive care. So they had the two feet. Over time, he is now smiling when they come into the room. He 
he's interacting when music is played. We are seeing a daily demonstration of more and more quality of life. That's a good story. You know, he could live for a long time with that two feet. And it's, it's demonstrating a quality. He has a quality in his day. There are other people that we've, we've experienced that um, haven't been able to communicate with us verbally, but they keep pulling the two feet out. So I think that they're sending us a message when we do that. And since we don't restrain people, and an abdominal binder would be a restraint, because that would restrict movement to a certain part of your body. Um, if somebody keeps pulling the two feeding out, then we try and decide, well, are, is that person trying to tell us something? And is it time to explore taking that two feeding away altogether and we've done that? And we've let that person die as a result of not being able to be fed. But it's been a discernment, it's included the family, it's included the physician, it's a, it's a whole process. So it's a lot easier to never put the tube feeding in than to withdraw it. And so if you have those conversations up front about, so what do you want, you know? Um, it helps us be able to not have to withdraw treatment if we never initiate it. And let, I want to just stop a moment and, and see if anybody wants to ask Sally any questions about you know, what this looks like or how these decisions are made. Or, um, We're the only Catholic nursing home in Spokane. Yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, the effect of this disability or the department's determination, is the determination that ANA should not work as a priori determination of the doctor that uh, based off the symptoms we believe that sitting in the ID will harm a person or does say nurse go and actually try the ID and monitor the patient and observe a degradation of quality of life or, or comfort and then withdraw ID? Um, I guess I, I guess to clarify, I can imagine the a nurse, uh, the patient family approaching a nurse or something asking why or not I'm hydrating uh, my dad or something. And the nurse explains that there's a multi system failure and a situation, and the patient family responds uh, is that just based off in theory, or did you actually try to uh, administer the ID before deciding to uh, withdraw that? You know, that's a great question. Um, kind of looking at a medical model versus patient-centered care model. If um, it's the same thing if, like, let's say that you don't want to be resuscitated. You don't want to be coded. But then your wife's in the room and you have an arrest. And she knew that you didn't want to be coded. But she can't stand to see you die. And so she's jumping up and down saying, code him, code him, code him. And so we code him. It's the same thing with the IV hydration or any kind of invasive treatment. Everybody has to be comfortable with the decision about the plan of treatment. And so if the family is questioning whether or not we should start that IV, whether we should hydrate the person, then it's not time to withdraw it. They all have to be on the, the same page that we're in a comfort care mode now. We're not going to initiate fluids. We're not going to initiate tube feedings. We know that, that this person is going to die as a result, and we're at peace with that. It isn't something that we kind of make decisions about on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a plan of care that we're all on the same page with because if anybody's in conflict with it, then it's it's not a good thing. That's not the type of care we want to give. Does that, does that answer your question? It's not a matter of the doctor being in charge. It's not a matter of the nurse being in charge. It's a matter of having that conversation with the people that are impacted by the situation and say, what do you want? How can we best honor this person? and have them have informed consent around benefit versus
bears this burden when it comes to, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and we're going to have to take this away, and we're going to have to take this away. And by the way, your insurance doesn't cover this, and it will cost. You need to be completely informed, and you have to be at peace with where you're going with the plan of treatment. Is that helpful? Yes, yes. Yes. So in a situation when someone signs a DNR, um, what, and say it comes to that point when the loved one's in the room and um, they're coding, what happens, will they still resuscitate if that, if the person is saying, do it, do it, but if they had signed a DNR? Yeah. When the, when the person is no longer with us, you know, they, they've had a cardiopulmonary arrest, and that other person becomes the decision maker. And so they can say, you know, go ahead and do the bells and whistles. Which means and you need to be really careful when you're thinking about who do you want to be making those decisions for you. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard nurses, right, who have said, you know, they're very clear about what they want, that, and they've signed certain advanced directives, but they've had conversations with their spouse, and the spouse has said, I couldn't do that. And I think it's important to know that, you know, I love you and I, I want to respect what you want, but I know I couldn't do that. Well, then it's a good idea to, to have, to appoint someone else to be your decision maker, someone who feels that they could go ahead and, and honor what you, what you want. And then they have to be at peace when you die. You know, to give you, you know, not that we're talking about that, we're talking more about artificial nutrition and hydration, but there was a case uh, of this young woman that was dying the only person that was with her was her teenage daughter. And everybody knew that this woman was at no code and she was at home. But when she started having her crisis and her event, her daughter was the only one that was with her. And her daughter was scared to death. And she had a pulse form and the pulse said, do not resuscitate. And the daughter got scared and she called 911. The ambulance showed up. and. The ambulance, the EMS guys, they looked at the pulse and said, don't resuscitate. They looked at the panic on the daughter's face saying, help her, help her, help her. And so they went ahead and helped her. And then they took her to the hospital. And in the hospital where that daughter could be supported and carried and, and cared for while her mother died, then they honored her mother's wishes to not resuscitate. So it's, it's not about the doctor or the nurse being in charge. It's about you having your wishes honored, figuring out what they are, and communicate them to people. I'm getting on my I know. Okay. <laughs> it's easy. Okay, so let's, let's talk more about, um, more. Let's talk about people in uh, persistent vegetative states. Um, you know, this is a person with, with a severe brain injury, and there, there can be different causes of that. But someone who's in a persistent vegetative state, this is someone who does not have cognitive or higher brain function. Only the brain stem uh, is, is functioning. And this person is unconscious, but what makes it particularly confusing, particularly to family members, is that even though this person is unconscious, uh, this person still has sleep and wake cycles, so there are gonna be parts of the day when this person's eyes are open. Um, and I'm sure you all saw numerous uh, pictures of Terry Schiavo where she appeared to be you know, staring into her mother's uh, face or, or whatever. I mean, she, her eyes were open at, at various uh, times during the day. The eyes are open and the eyes um, move during the awake cycle, but um, there may be other spontaneous movements of, of arms and, and uh, legs. The person may smile at times, grimace, laugh, make guttural sounds, moan, a variety of, of noises. Um, but what, one of the key diagnostic um, elements in vegetative state is that, that the person's eyes so even though they may be open, 
they don't track, they aren't following objects or persons, and they don't fix on a particular person. So they're moving more or less randomly. Um, the diagnosis of a vegetative state requires expertise, um, requires repeated neurological exams that have to be done over a period of, of time. In terms of a persistent vegetative state is that is a period where the diagnosis is still being confirmed. Um, so we're seeing these, these symptoms, but it's unclear, is this person going to get better? Right? This person could move into what's called a minimally conscious state, um, and from there, in rare situations, could actually regain uh, consciousness and function, but much more likely is, is to move from what's considered persistent to a permanent vegetative state. And here it does depend on the cause of, of the, the brain damage. If it's due to oxygen deprivation, which might be due to a drowning accident or a cardiac arrest, um, this vegetative state is considered permanent after three months. So after three months, it would be extremely rare right, that this person would regain any kind of, of consciousness. If it's due to some sort of traumatic brain injury, right, perhaps a car accident or you know, near some... Drowning. Pardon? Near drowning. Okay. Um, the person is, is considered permanent after 12 months. It's a longer uh, period. In any case, the survival in a permanent vegetative state is generally somewhere between two to five years in uh, nursing homes. Um, and people in this, this permanent uh, vegetative state, they may have reflex reactions to noxious stimuli. Right? If you poke them with a sharp instrument, there may be a reflex, um, but they lack cerebral cortical capacity to be conscious of pain or suffering. So it's important to, to recognize that these are persons who, you know, they don't have any experiences. They, they don't have awareness. They don't have consciousness. So it's not simply that they're not going to sit down with you and talk about uh, calculus, right, and do some derivatives for you, but it's also that this person has no ability to relate, to respond, no awareness that someone is in the room or not in the room, no uh, experience, whether it's light or dark, warm or cold. Right? This person lacks right, the brain capacity to have that kind of experience or awareness. Uh, the, the kind of uh, diagnosis of this is complex, and it does require people with expertise. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to say, I think we lost. Oh, OK, thank you. It may just be that you have time now. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, we've all heard stories about someone who was in a persistent vegetative state for 16 years and suddenly woke up, right? On careful e examination, that person was not in a permanent vegetative state. That person might have been diagnosed as being in a permanent vegetative state, but that person more likely was in what's called a minimally conscious state. I mean, there are two very famous examples. One, uh, a person who made a very dramatic recovery after 19 years and another after nine years. Um, but these are not people who were ever had lost that uh, cortical kind of capacity. This was, this was someone who was in what's called 
minimally conscious state. Um, so, in 2004, papal allocution on persistent vegetative state included these key statements that there should be a presumption in favor of providing nutrition and hydration to all patients, including those who require medical, artificially provided nutrition and hydration, a stress on the intrinsic and personal dignity of every human being, regardless of their, their circumstances, and third, that providing food and water, even when medically provided, is in principle proportionate and as such morally obligatory insofar as it does provide nutrition to the patient and alleviate suffering. Well, if we look at this, right, and when this, this statement came out, there were lots and lots of uh, responses, lots of questions, lots of confusion, um, and it took some time, but uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, right, in 2007, issued some clarifications, right, and here were some of the key questions they were asked. The first question was, so is the provision of artificial nutrition and hydration to those in a persistent vegetative state morally obligatory, except when it cannot be assimilated? So this person's uh, physically can no longer uh, absorb uh, the nutrition and hydration, or when it causes significant physical discomfort, the sort of thing Sally was talking about when uh, death is imminent. Uh, the answer from the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith was yes. In all other cases, it's obligatory. The second question was, may artificial nutrition and hydration be withdrawn from a persistent vegetative state or permanent vegetative state patient when physicians judge the patient will never recover? So in other words, this, this patient's past that three month uh, marker or the 12 month marker, uh, in many cases probably, you know, significantly past that. And, the definitive answer uh, has been no. Uh, in 2009, the, the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services, um, very key document that guides Catholic health care, was revised to reflect this, this change. Um, and one more here. The question of, are there any exceptions to the obligation? Again, the answer was excessive burdens or physical discomfort uh, due to the complications of the means of providing, right? So medically, it's just not working anymore. Or there are other medical complications. Or um, there is some allowance for someone who might be in, a, in an extremely remote geographic location where you know there just isn't uh, expertise to continue to provide this care, or in cases of very extreme uh, poverty. So I'm going to go back here to the to the allocution. In light of, of the handout I gave you to start with on, on proportional reasoning, what what stands out or jumps out at you about what's changed here? What's the, the shift that's taking place? How is this uh, directive reflect a shift right, in moral decision making? What's different? Possibility. Of, I mean, benefit has now been reduced to a purely physiological. Can this person absorb the nutrition, hydration? 
right? That's right. So benefit, which which previously was considered in a very holistic kind of way to mean physical, psychological, or relational, etc., is now very narrow. What else strikes you as different? Yeah, Michael. I have not read the allocution, or if I did, it's a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, actually, last week would be a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but the language here you quote and you underline, emphasize, is presumption in favor of <coughs> uh, intrinsic and personal dignity is stressed um, in principle proportionate and as such. But right. there is in that language not an absolute no but a stress on the beginning, uh, how one enters into these decisions. And I, am I misunderstanding this? Because it sounds like what we said earlier indicated this was right. a conclusion. Right. And as I read what okay. you put up here, no, I don't see that. Okay. There's always been a presumption in favor of feeding and hydrating people. But the key is the last point here, that now artificial nutrition and hydration is being put in a category saying, in principle, artificial nutrition and hydration is always proportionate. Rather than, there's a presumption right, that we're going to feed and hydrate people to, it's an obligation to always feed and hydrate people, even if it requires medical means to do that. Well, that may be what, that, this is the trick, I don't, if I say in principle, 